Steel is stronger and harder than nature made us. In order to have good command over this unyielding material, we must build up an arsenal of tooling and a method by which to use them. A great forging is not just great because you made it that way, but because of every surface it touches and how they were made, every step along the way and what order they were taken in. The communication and culture that forms a chain from the need of an item, its concept and design, the dialogue between what is aesthetic and what is possible, the translation of the design through the forging method and the tooling that supports it, and finally, the reconciliation of the finished product and the need it was made to fill. This chain can be small and involve only one person making something for themselves, or it can stretch to encompass hundreds of people and thousands of man-hours. While the design and the result are not always simple, and rightfully so, it is our job to shorten that chain. While the human mind respects complexity and detail, refinement and art and value and presence, iron only yields to pragmatism and power. It is our job to make beautiful, functional things, and to do so efficiently and without stumbling on the way. Whether you are a one-man blacksmith shop or the foreman that oversees a forge, every day you refine that chain, perfect your method, and improve your tooling. None of us start out with every tool you will ever need, and there is always a balance between doing something the hard way and getting by, or investing the time and money to overcome the hurdles in your way. The market is always changing, fashion and art never sleeps, and to be competitive in a growing community where so many strive to offer a high-end touch and affordable custom ironwork, you cannot stagnate. You can't do an old thing the old way. Today we will explore power hammers and talk about their capabilities and limitations, their effects on your work and your methods. So first let's lay down some groundwork. What is a power hammer? What is the difference between a power hammer and a press? What are some of the common parts of a power hammer? And what are some of the categories of hammers that have been produced and are available today? When you hammer, you slowly build up energy by accelerating a mass up to speed. Then that mass strikes something which causes the mass to decelerate more quickly than it was accelerated. The input energy may be low, but over time it adds up, and when the mass decelerates, the output energy is very high, but for a short time. Simply, a little bit of work over a long time equals a lot of work over a short time, making a hammer a metal smashing super battery. In a power hammer, the mass is accelerated by an automated method and the head is often driven to high speeds, thus greatly increasing the energy output. It is here where we must draw a line between a hammer and a press. A machine is a hammer when over half the pressure applied to the work in an interaction between the head and work is caused by the direct deceleration of the head. If any less than half of the pressure is provided by mechanical means, then the machine is a press. For example, a fly press may act like a hammer, but once the head stops moving, the fly wheel continues to apply pressure through a lever, wedge, or screw to the head, thus using a mechanical advantage to provide the brunt of the pressure used to do the work. This makes for a considerable difference in how you approach the forging process, and while much translates between the two and there is more than a bit of gray area in between, we must nevertheless draw a line between the two. A hammer has the advantage because it can rely on speed and mass, thus it can use the inertia of the work or a static anvil rather than a rigid frame to further the work that it can do.
so we can define a power hammer as a machine that uses a direct buildup of kinetic energy to directly do work. Most power hammers have four main parts, a head ram or top, a drive system, a frame, and an anvil. There are, of course, uncountable exceptions to this. For instance, a hammer mill forging pipe around a mandrel may have many heads or no anvil to speak of, or a demolition hammer, when used to forge, may have no frame and no anvil but the piece of work itself. The hammer head is often more than one single piece. The main mass of the head is attached to dies that can be changed or replaced. All parts that are firmly attached to the head are parts of it, and while the head may not be perfectly rigid, it is not as important since it spends very little time in contact with the work and the after effect of the strike do not affect the piece you are working on like the after effects of the anvil do. The movement of the head of a hammer is quantified into an energetic wave. The energetic wave consists of the finite uptime, the fall point, the finite downtime, the impact point, the detention time, the finite delta point, and the release point. Every hammer is different, and different setups work well for one thing, but perhaps not another. Also, the energetic wave must be tuned to suit not only the work the head is hitting, but must also be tuned to work with the frame and anvil. If these things do not match, the hammer will not be harmonious in its action. It is not a necessity to understand this to its full extent, and it is often that a good operator can overcome a poorly running machine. However, a basic understanding of the energetic wave can help you to tune your way out of most bad situations. Most hammers have an adjustment that can be made to affect the energetic wave. After all, the main lever or foot pedal is only an adjustment to that wave. Next, the drive system of a hammer is often its greatest strength and its greatest weakness. Turning the work of an electric motor into speed or into compressed air and then back into speed means heat and friction and moving parts. This means you have to shed that heat, which isn't always easy, and keep those moving parts moving. The frame of the hammer has many roles. The head must be accelerated during the finite downtime, kept on track during the detention time, and then raised again during the finite uptime. When throwing the head downward, the force is often enough to raise the hammer off the ground if it is not heavy enough or if it is not attached to the ground. Once the head hits, if the hit is not centered and the head rolls off to one side, then the frame must absorb that energy and be flexible enough not to break, but rigid enough to return to center before the next hit. The frame must be able to do all these things and do them a quarter million times a week and not succumb to stress breaks and fatigue. Lastly, the anvil. It is often overlooked for the many complex roles it must fulfill. The anvil is often viewed too narrowly and for our purposes here, we will look at its roles separately. The anvil's first role is to facilitate the deceleration of the head through the soft medium that has been placed between it and the head. As the head hits the piece being forged, pressure between the two builds and the hot iron begins to flow. The energy of the decelerating head starts its work on the hot piece of iron, but at the same time the inertia of the piece of iron gives way and the hot iron becomes free to start to accelerate. It is at this time that it hits the anvil. The anvil's inertia keeps it in place for a little while, and this is the time when hot iron will flow the fastest, because the head is moving at its maximum speed. The hot iron is already under pressure, and the anvil is perfectly rigid. But nothing lasts forever, and the anvil succumbs to the pressure applied to it and begins to try to move away as its inertia gives way. The anvil is often too large to fully compress or move before the head. This is where we must divide the anvil into two sections, the active anvil and the passive anvil. 
The active anvil section will have had time to compress before the head stops moving at the finite delta point. The passive anvil will be non-reactive, or only accelerating but not compressing, as in the case of a mass anvil. Now you have this piece of steel that is under compression. It has successfully absorbed the energy of the head, or not, and now it begins to expand again. As it expands, if the hammer head is still in contact, then the anvil will apply pressure again to the hot iron, and then back up into the head of the hammer, thus launching it upward. But if the head leaves too soon, and the detention time is too short for the size of the active section of the anvil, then the work will be kicked up into the air away from the anvil. The rest of the anvil's job is to keep the active part of the anvil contained and dissipate the massive force that has just hit it without adversely affecting the hot iron being forged. The passive part of the anvil can include parts of the frame and the mass of the floor, provided that it and the anvil are well attached to one another. All of these parts must work together and be both tuned and balanced for the hammer to run well. There have been many variations of power hammers produced, and not all hammers handle these roles well in all circumstances. The first type of hammer we will look at are mechanical hammers. There is no doubt that the first power hammers made were mechanical hammers. The little giant comes to mind, but there are many hammers that fall into this category, such as trip hammers, boundary hammers, and all manner of hammers intended for use by line drives and open power sources. Even gravity drop hammers can be placed in this category. These hammers are easy to understand. Their parts need not be precise, and most will continue to work long after they have fallen into disrepair. The advantage is their ruggedness, but the sheer number of moving parts, springs, and wear surfaces typically ensure that the hammers, unless well overbuilt and fastidiously maintained, do not stay in their prime for long. Also, by their very nature, mechanical hammers are difficult to adjust and oftentimes need constant maintenance. For their nostalgia, mechanical hammers are wonderful, and in the right application, they are the correct tool to use. But for most open die free form forging, they are only a great pastime. For a businessman, they are simply too difficult to maintain. Next, there are air hammers, of which there are two subgroups. There are those with a self-contained compressor that is also a vacuum generator in some instances. The movement of the head is tied directly to the movement of the compressor piston. These hammers are simply called self-contained hammers. Then the other subgroup of air hammers are utility hammers, which typically use an external compressor to build up pressure. The hammer itself works by using that air pressure to make it run. In both cases, the hammer uses air as both a transference of energy, a cushion, and as a spring. Both types of air hammers use the air as a delivery system for lubrication. Self-contained hammers have many great advantages. For instance, considering the amount of input power, they produce a great deal of work, using the air to apply a great speed boost to the head right before it hits. The nature of the self-contained compressor also makes for an extended detention time that grows longer as the hammers are built larger and larger. There is a point at which a self-contained hammer becomes impractically large, but by far they have proven that they can be scaled up and down without much design change from tiny hammers that are more akin to sewing machines to oversized goliaths that dwarf their counterparts. But we cannot escape the ideal gas law, and any time you compress a gas, you get a buildup of heat. Under heavy loads, these hammers cycle air back and forth, and the heat in the compressor can rise to levels that will cause the machine to cease its function. Some self-contained hammers deal with this better than others, and there are a great variety of fixes that have been implemented, such as idling the hammer in between heats to cycle cool air through it. The only other disadvantage is that the seals in these hammers are large, and oftentimes the air piston is the head of the hammer, and the air cylinder is part of the frame. Without access to manufacturer-made parts or the ability to rework large machines, these hammers can become difficult to coax back into life once they had suffered a malfunction. This said, there are manufacturers that still support these hammers, and new self-contained hammers are available. Utility hammers gain a similar power boost to their self-contained kin via dynamic compression and ease of adjustment. 
they have a great advantage and that they do not need to idle and thus are silent when not in use as well as not consuming power while most external air compressors do not hold a candle to the amount of production by the large piston compressors of a self-contained hammer, they can operate remotely, constantly building pressure and shedding the heat from that production of air elsewhere. Meanwhile, the hammer, which is decompressing air, gets colder as it runs. Even a vastly undersized compressor will operate a utility hammer at full power if only for a little while, and compressed shop air is very common if not a must for most shops anyways. Their disadvantage lies in scale. Common utility hammers may require between 2 to 25 cubic feet per minute of shop air in order to run, which is commonly available in many shop air systems. But as they are scaled up larger and larger, the air consumption becomes astronomical and impractical to implement. This is the main reason you don't see many 500-pound utility hammers. The last category is hydraulic hammers. Hydraulic hammers are amongst some of the largest hammers in the world. They function in several ways. Some hydraulic hammers, like presses with a hammer function, allow the pump to spool up and then quickly close a valve at the highest speed of the pump, accelerating the ram allowing for a short but powerful stroke that is, by definition, a blow from a hammer. The next uses hydraulic pressure to raise an enormous head to height and then let gravity do the rest. The last type keeps hydraulic pressure on the bottom of the cylinder while pressure is built up on the top of the cylinder, for either as an air pocket, nitrogen bladder, or nitrogen injected directly into the hydraulic fluid of the top of the cylinder lay. When the valve of the bottom of the cylinder is opened, no more fluid needs to be pumped into the top of the cylinder as the gas expands explosively firing the head downward. At this point, the flow of fluid out of the bottom of the cylinder can be monitored and stopped at a particular amount, letting the head come to a stop at a set point of height. The disadvantage is that these hammers are complex and expensive, and so far have been mostly unapplied in the smaller field of forging. It is important to keep in mind that bigger is not always better. Picking a hammer that fits your application and is approachable as well as easy to use is important. The more a hammer can be made an easier part of your day-to-day -day operation, the better both you and it will do. It is prohibitive to have a machine that required special skill and consideration to run for its shortcoming or a machine that is so expensive to operate that it cannot be operated at leisure. This is where we will pick up in the next video and talk about training staff, developing product, and some of the cool things you can make under a power hammer, as well as some insight into the day-to-day -day operations at Oak Hill Iron and why you can never have too many power hammers. Thank you.